This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, thank you everybody for having me in my first time at Cornell. So Neil mentioned my being at UC Riverside. Um, I was in Toshmer Shady's lab, you know, in the salt sweet tissue culture. That's the lab I came from. And he was really unhappy at UC Riverside back then uh, in the early 70s. And he always threatened about coming to Cornell and who would bring his whole lab group. So my wife and I did a lot of research about coming to Cornell back then. So that would have been my linkage uh, to uh, so Cornell. But so, but now this is my first time being here <laughs> 40 years later, 50 years later. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, this project of developing landscape plan uh, irrigation recommendations for the Western US. I'm going to, we're going to talk about some background of uh, how this got started, how this research, line of research in my lab got started. Uh, and it was specifically uh, centered around uh, regulations and uh, water conservation and landscapes in the state. And then I'll, of course, describe the studies, um, how we set up the experiment, because that, in our, in this case, it's really, I think, unique, how we collect data, how we present results, because being an extension specialist, I have to uh, provide outreach and extension. And then uh, the current project is now, it's a multi-state project, um, talk about some future work that's coming up, and then what the impacts have been of this research on the industry. So let's get started with background. So in California, there's this regulation statewide ordinance called the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. Uh, it was actually initiated in 2010, so it's pretty old. Uh, but you know, water in California is always a premium issue. And so this ordinance comes into play when a uh, building permit is needed. So if, if you renovate a landscape, and you uh, do some work that uh, requires a building permit, then that triggers this ordinance. If you build a new uh, landscape, commercial or residential, then that triggers this ordinance because a building permit is required. So in this ordinance, you have to estimate the, uh, the annual water use for the new landscape. Of course, it requires the math. Uh, then you have to compare it to a, another measure of, um, that would be the allowed volume of water and do the comparison. If the estimated water use is greater than the allowable, then you have to make adjustments. And we'll, we'll go into detail about how these calculations are done. Okay, so here's the uh, the estimated total water use for the, the new landscape is this formula. This is formula is, was developed by the Department of Water Resources, the agency that's uh, uh, enforcing this regulation. And so these Variables are uh, the estimated total water use, reference ET, this is a conversion factor. Plant factor is the plant factor for the uh, particular plant that's in the landscape. So you might think of it as a species coefficient for crops. Uh, HA is the, the uh, hydrozone area or the irrigated area. IE is the irrigation efficiency. You might think of that as the distribution uniformity of the irrigation system. And then SLA are, is a uh, allowance for special landscape areas. So this would be vegetable gardens, uh, areas that are being irrigated with reclaimed water where they would be an allowance for al allowing more water use in those areas. So this is the, that estimated total water use for a year. The uh, plant factor is the issue. Uh, so just re recall this, uh, remember this, this acronym vocals. So we'll talk about this in more detail. So these numbers come from this document. And I'll go into that in a little bit. So the comparison number is the maximum applied water allowance or MAWA, and that's this formula. So again, uh, reference ET conversion factor, ETAF, this is now a ET conversion factor or allowance factor for uh, residential or commercial. You can see it's 0.55 for residential and 0.45 uh, times uh, for the commercial. So it's essentially, the allowable water use is 55% of the water that the reference crop would use for a residential and 45% of the water use for the reference crop. This quantity over here is the allowance for um, the special landscape area. So it's adding back that subtraction to the special landscape area. So it's, it's a, you see it's a lot of math. Homeowners, are if they trigger this permit, permitting process, they're expected to do this math. Uh, landscape architects and designers are usually the ones that uh, have to uh, 
uh, submit permits and uh, guide the homeowner through this process. The county or city municipal people are the ones that have to review this, uh, and they have to also understand the map and to be able to enforce it. Um, the tricky part, though, is this ETAF and then that plant factor that uh, uh, we talked about earlier. <clears throat> So again, you compare the two values, if the estimated total water use is greater than the maximum applied water allowance, then you have to adjust the landscape to reduce the water use to make that, uh, that fit. So talking about the plant factor, this is language from the ordinance. It says the plant factor used shall be from locals or from horticultural researchers with academic institutions or professional associations as approved by the California Department of Water Resources. So I put this part in bold here because this part was added later after we started our research and we started submitting our plants large numbers into this document. The original language did not include this parameter or this parameter. It just said plant factor shall be from wolves. Now, when you put this kind of language in an ordinance, shall is a really strict term. It has to come from this document. Well, the unintended consequences of DWR were is that, that you can't use any other plants unless they are in this list. If they're not in this list, then you can't get the plant factor. Back then, there was only 1,900 plants in this list. In California, there's an estimate, wild estimates of or wide ranging estimates of 10 to 20,000 cultivars of plants used in urban landscape in California. They had it down to the cultivar level? Yes, yeah. So I want to talk about what this Wilkins is. <clears throat> so this stands for the land, water use classifications of landscape species that's currently in version four. Uh, it is a searchable database of landscape plants in California. It does include plant factors that I'll describe uh, in more detail in a little bit. Currently it has 3,500 plants and it is now being updated. Dave Fugino's uh, got a grant now to update it. It, originally, version three was 1,900 plants. They've got to expend 3,500 plants. Still not enough, uh, but I, I think they're trying to push down for 5,000, but still not enough, but it's more than 1,900. So here are the URLs for these documents. I think if you if you just use locals as a search term, you there's nothing else called locals. So you'll get it. Uh, you'll get version four. I put this one up here, local00.pdf. This is version three. This one is really important because it's in two sections. The first section of it is called the landscape coefficient method. So it talks about how to use this information, how different factors in landscapes uh, affect plant water use, canopy density, uh, uh, plant density, slopes, aspect, things like that, how all these factors uh, affect the microclimates and, and, and water usage. So it's a really good um, uh, learning guide for people in landscapes and trying to understand and manage uh, landscape irrigation. So the way that this list, these lists were developed, um, focus groups were uh, formed of horticultural experts in six different, in each of six different climate zones. These are defined, defined by the Department of Water Resources. So these focus groups and these horticulture experts are, I consider, Plant frogs, they, they just know plants really well. If I need information on a plant, I go to one of these people. They really know plants in California. They review plant lists and they categorize those plants by vote uh, into these, um, these, these categories. High, high, moderate, low, very, very low water use. And you've seen they attach these ranges of reference ET uh, uh, factors into to these descriptive uh, labels. So they really don't have a plant factor, but have a range. So what landscape architects and people do to comply with this ordinance, guess which number they use? They use the lowest one, right? And to, to make sure that they comply, well, that's, it's, that's what I would do. Um, but just keep in mind too, these ranges. So 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.8 are the mid ranges of these, of these, uh, uh, these uh, descriptors because that will come up later in, in our experiments. So that brings up the, the research project. Uh, um, in California, we call it landscape, the uh, UC Landscape Plants Irrigation Trials. 
but the acronym is UCL PIT. Um, if you Google UCL PIT, you probably get our, our web page. And the objective of this project was to actually develop these plant factors um, by using research methods instead of focus groups. <clears throat> so you can see a picture of, the, of one of the fields here where um, you can see the different irrigation lines. There's three irrigation lines, uh, each delivering a treatment to, um, to the plants in the field. So it's, uh, the plants are randomized, the treatments are randomized. The uh, reference ET number that we get is from CIMIS, which is the California Irrigation Management Information System. And it just turns out that this system in California was developed in, uh, I think, late 1970s by Rick Snyder, who's a biometeorologist on campus. It's a statewide system for to support um, agronomic crops in the state to help them manage more precisely irrigation. There happens to be a CIMIS weather station on campus uh, it's only about a mile and a half from our site, so we use that information. And we actually had Rick come out and uh, do us conduct a study of our site and give us some factors so we can tweak that number even further for our site because it's not a typical uh, a monocultural crop, uh, and it's uh, it's just different than uh, an agronomic crop. So the treatments we use are uh, these factors of ET again, those mid ranges of those. Uh, of those descriptors on those that, uh, within those ranges of ET that were attached. Uh, originally, we started with 20, 40, 60, 80 because they were nice divisions of, of, uh, of, of the of ET. Uh, we had five relevance of treatment. Uh, it wasn't robust. We were getting good statistical results. Uh, so, and for two reasons, we changed it to match those descriptors and whipples and to increase the number of replicates to eight where we get better statistical um, uh, uh, power, uh, we, we changed it to 2080, 5080. And it's been like that for 15 years now. So one of the first steps is we need to know about the soil. Uh, I don't know if you know about this web called Soil Web, this app called Soil Web. It's a digitized version of the USGS soil, soil surveys. Uh, it's a really cool app if you all your phones have GPS now. If you can uh, uh, activate this app, and it will tell you the soil type of your site. It's a really cool app. And the the factor we, we use in it, uh, there's a plant available water factor that's listed in the uh, the soil description for, uh, of your soils. And so we irrigate the, the the plants with a fixed volume. Most other irrigation type trials, for at least for landscape plants, they might uh, have a fixed schedule of irrigation, and then they vary the, the volume of water that's applied to MAP GT, which is the wrong thing to do. We tell people irrigate deeply and infrequently. So we irrigate with a fixed volume, but the interval between application varies based on GT. So that's what makes that this, this project different. So knowing what the plant available water is, uh, we uh, have a 50% amount manageable management allowable depletion. So when F of PAWs is depleted, then that's when we refill uh, that vessel uh, of water. But, you know, you know what happens if you go to the you have dead plants, right? That's can't, can't it. So we just use this generalized uh, this guideline that's pretty commonly used uh, for our uh, trigger. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, the interval between irrigation varies with weather based on ET. And for an example, in 2019, the trip, our, our irrigation season is between April and, and September. Uh, we get essentially zero rainfall in this, in this period. In our area, in California, um, we get 80% of our rainfall occurs in 90 days from uh, December to the February. So we know in California, we haven't filled that precipitation bottle, that gas tank, you know, we're in trouble. Uh, we had a miracle March one year uh, when uh, February was really dry. Up till February was really dry, we had a miracle March that we filled. We had all, all that snowpack that saved us. But normally, uh, we don't have that. And again, so April, uh, mid April to September is our irrigation season. You can see what the number of irrigations and the interval between irrigations are. So 36 days between irrigations in California. Wow. 
there's a long time, it's a month between irrigations. When we were first doing, setting up the experiments, we were coming up with these numbers. We were about 20%, you know, we're going to be killing a lot of plants. And the surprising thing is we don't, we really don't. So data collection, um, we take uh, uh, one set of physical measurements. Uh, we have a plant growth index where we um, measure the width of the plant uh, in two dimensions, uh, perpendicular to each other, and then the height, and we come up with this plant growth index. Uh, this is Jared Cisner, he's the, the project manager. This is probably him when he was a software undergraduate, so he's been working with me for like 11 years now. He's a uh, he was a staff research associate, so staff researcher. Now he decided to go, go back after lots of prodding to get his graduate degree. So, uh, so we do this once a month. Uh, year one is plant establishment. So we typically plant uh, put the plants around in November of the year, November through about uh, uh, February, mid February during the winter. That first summer is an establishment year. We give the plants. Uh, about the 80% treatment of irrigation to make sure that they get established. Uh, the, the management of uh, a lot of depletion, we lose 25% to make sure we don't kill the plants because they're, they're still young. And then just go through the second winter. The second irrigation season is when we apply the treatments. And during that treatment um, season, then we also collect this qualitative uh, information. So overall appearance, foliage, foliage quality, Flowering, we actually collect this twice a month. Uh, pest resistance, disease resistance, and vigor. So these, these are, of course, qualitative. We have well-defined rubrics for five steps uh, within each of, the, uh, of uh, each of these uh, parameters. Oops. We also have uh, open house field days. Um, um, Pre-COVID, in Davis and Southern California, we would have three events spring, summer, and fall. We would invite horticulture professionals, master gardeners, anybody that had uh, uh, more experience with gardening. Uh, we wouldn't invite the general public. For example. We'd invite them to come out to the fields. We'd see the a group of them uh, in our field. We would ask them to rate uh, the plants for, for performance. What we would do is we would pick a plant, um, the best looking plant of a treatment, and we would tag that in, in our field. And we would ask the the visitors to, to rate those plants. We typically get between 50 and 80 people in for an event, event. And it takes about an hour and a half or so to go through 12 months. And so what we do is we uh, collect this, uh, this information from these ratings, um, and then we will combine those ratings with our monthly data that we collect and see how they cooperate. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, we also ask, ask some questions about what your favorite plants were, which ones do you, would you like, which one do you think that you will probably use in the future in your projects, just to see what uh, the feeling was about these plants. Here's our uh, website. Um, this is a, you're going to be seeing some screenshots. So I know some of the text is, won't be readable, but uh, uh, I'll try to, I will um, uh, have it. Low, low ups of enlargements of the text that I'd like you to see. So, this is just the home, this home page. You can see there's contact us, our contacts, award winners. There's a plant index of all the plants we've tested, history of the, the projects, how we do the, the research. Uh, there are written reports that we put together every year uh, for uh, funding agencies. So, those are here. And then there's some other stuff here. So, here's the again, if you if you do a search of UCL, then you'll probably come to our site because there's nothing else called that. Uh, I want to go to these award winners, um, this pull down here. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, um, further down on this page, there's you know we get a lot of industry support. I talked about uh, plants that uh, that are included in the. Well, I haven't talked about plants that are included in the project, but originally we started out with some plants that were selected by the arboretum. Uh, then we expanded it out to the industry, plant developers, plant uh, breeders. Uh, if they wanted to, for us to develop information on their plants, we would offer space to them for a, for a small fee, like 500 bucks uh, per plant. It actually costs us, we estimated between $1,600 and $1,800, about $2,000 per plant to do these studies for the time, materials, and things. 
So these are some of the companies that have um, uh, submitted plants and that we collected information on. Ball Ornamentals was, was the first um, company to, to uh, submit plants for our trials, and they submit plants every year. Uh, and you know now that Star Roses and Plants is part of that, uh, that group. Um, Heinz Horticulture now is uh, called the Verdict Growers. Um, uh, Tree Town Real Estate Company bought all the Heinz nurseries and consolidated the, their, their nurseries into the Verdict Growers. Uh, they submit plants every year. And you can see some other plants that are probably uh, uh, recognizable. A village nursery is part of that Verdi. Um, team. <clears throat> so I want to pull down the, these award winners. We have several categories of blue ribbon winners, which I'll talk about more depth. So these are the plants that uh, have performed well. So our rubrics, our rating rubrics are, is a one to five score. Five is a perfect plant. So if plants did well at a 20% treatment and have score four or larger or higher, they were selected as blue ribbon winner. Happy mediums, if they did well at 50% treatment, then they fall in this, this group. People's Choice Awards, the visitors that come, uh, we have asked them what their favorite plants are, and that's that list, and then staff picks are our favorites. So I wanna talk about a little more about um, what's in these lists, and I'll, I wanna go to the Blue Ribbon winners. And this is a description of that page. We have a logo that's associated with those, with those plants. Um, and you can see this 2021 data. We haven't actually put in our 2022 data yet. Uh, and I'll explain that later uh, in, the, uh, in the talk, why we haven't done that yet. But you can see there's uh, some interesting winners. Uh, there's Lomandrin, three roses on this list. The roses do really well at low water. And is it just one year? Yeah. I mean, you have the establishment year. And then you one year trial. Right. And then plow everything under and pull them out, out, and then we we we, 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 we furbish the field and put another yeah. crop. Okay. We do have crops now. We have one field. So a little more detail about this field. The, the plants are under two meter by two meters spacing. Some of the plants, uh, unknowingly to the developers, are get really large. So we have another field that's three by three meters, uh, where we put in plants that we suspect are going to be larger, and the last year we've actually let that field go to a second evaluation because we have always had that question what happens in, in, in the second year um, but you know these this, this it takes a lot of space okay. yeah and space at universities you know means not right so, so this is just a blow of that page then just saying uh pointing out the two lamentra species or club bars and the three rows and we have a separate list for UC Davis uh, Blue Ribbon winner, winners and uh, uh, a list for the plants tested in Southern California. I'll, I'll have a description of this location a little bit later. So if we click on the UC Davis list, we get another page. This is a, another page of all the plants that we that made this Blue Ribbon um, a, a winner. We have the 50% 50, 50 shade house where we test plants with dry shade. So that's uh, where we did um, um, note where the plants were tested, whether it's in shade or sun, the year was tested, what the mean of overall uh, appearance rating was. So the this award is based on this overall appearance rating because that's what people want. They want to see what the visual uh, impact is. <clears throat> so just to get some, uh, these are all these are all live. Uh, links. Uh, um, this is a selection of one. So this is all of our Martini and Pelle Agnes. I'm not an Pelle Agnes fan, but this one was pretty cool. So this is a picture of it in uh, in Davis. Uh, so there's a summary of uh, what it looked like, how it performed in the, in the field. We have some uh, some data. It was who was submitted by, where it was, uh, what field, the year, uh, the year, the the size at the end of two years of growth. What the plant submitter suspects the uh, maturity size would be, size of maturity would be. Uh, uh, Wilkles plant type, Wilkles has uh, categories of plant types, shrubs, trees, um, ground covers, et cetera. Uh, these, uh, this recommendation is uh, for the different regions, the, that the DWR climate regions, region two and three, 
um, and what our recommendations are for water needs, and then what the overall scores were for the you know, appearance ratings that UC Davis and at, at South Coast in Southern California. And that's the, this is the, essentially the, the information that a plan, uh, planner would, would be using for their, their landscapes for that, that ordinance to, uh, to kind of calculate those numbers. So also as we put in some data too, because people sometimes want to see data, and most people don't, but some people do. So this is the, the, uh, the ratings, categories, the treatments, and the, the numbers, so the ratings by month, and then the average for those months. So you can see this, uh, this plant had really high ratings for all three treatments. We also put in the data that the open house participants uh, develop because they don't often they often don't match ours, um, and that's okay. Um, and you can kind of see so this you can see the the only things that we ask for in the visitors ratings are overall appearance, foliage quality, and floor display because those are the visual things. Uh, you can see the different treatments in the different seasons. Uh, the thing that's really puzzling here, this is Ali Agnes, it's non-flowering, but we did get ratings for flowering. Well, that's one of the reasons why we, we have uh, visitors have been do this and then why we compare it to ours because sometimes we get some really screwy things like this up. But you can see that they um, they didn't rate this quite as high in the in the fall, but in the earlier parts of the seasons, it rated pretty high. So you can see that the quality fell off during, during the, the irrigation season. Here's some data on the, uh, uh, the fiscal uh, measurements. And this is uh, uh, the, the monthly plant growth index number. So you can see that uh, there, you can see that there was a treatment effect maybe, but you know, statistically it's probably not significant. But the other thing that we uh, do is we uh, do a comparison for relative plant growth. So we set uh, the initial ratings as one, and then these are essentially percentages of growth uh, compared to the original rating. So you now can see some really clear uh, differences. And so this allows for, when you put plants in the ground, we put, we put 24 plants in the ground. They're not identical. They don't um, grow, even though when you get them, they're pretty close to the same size. They don't establish the same rate. They don't grow the same rate. So you get a lot of variability. That's a problem with field studies, right? It's variability. So we found that by um, uh, comparing both these relative plant growth index indexes that kind of takes away that variability for those initial sizes, we can get some clear uh, information on the statistics, on the statistics. You can see that this plant was physically smaller than the higher treatment but the overall rating, appearance rates, ratings was still really high. So, and we don't really care about size, I think, in the landscapes. Maybe we prefer smaller plants because of less maintenance and things like that. So this has turned out to be a really nice, really nice plant. Here's a close up of the foliage, nice glossy green uh, foliage compared to the our normal uh, LA Agnes that we normally see. So this is a little bit of history uh, that I want to get into. Um, this started out as a master's thesis research project for a student student Carrie. She actually went on to be a, um, a county advisor for horticulture in California. So this was her, uh, she finished her thesis in 2004. Um, and then once she got to, um, she finished and we established this UC plants irrigation trials. In 2009, we built the shade house to do dry shade plants. 2017, we had uh, some funding from the California Department of Food and Ag that allowed us to completely repair our fields in Southern California. This is UC South Coast Research and Extension Center in Irvine in Southern California. It's not associated with UC Irvine, but people assume and it's not. Um, so this is a picture of their fields in, in Southern California. So that allowed us to do a Northern California, Southern California comparison. We would have the same set of plants in both locations same treatment, same, everything else is the same, uh, except the location, and that allowed us to do some California or the California treatments. And that we would also make recommendations based on the different, irrigation recommendations based on the different parts of the state. In 2020, we got a USDA grant that allowed us to expand the, uh, the fields, replicate the fields at the University of Washington, Oregon State, Utah State, 
and University of Arizona. So now we have six locations across this really wide latitude across the Western US where we do these comparisons. All the methods are identical. Uh, we Every year we meet and re review the, the rubrics. And we actually go out to the field, but we all stand around the same plant, make our, our, our comparisons and see if everybody comes up with the same source because that's the other variable, variable is the, the people collecting the data or especially for quality data. So we try to standardize that, keep that standardized throughout the year. And so that's what this allowed us to we have this, 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 this standardized method across these locations that allowed us to, to allow us to evaluate plants uh, performance. And then recommend uh, the objective now is to make irrigate recommended recommendations for these plants across these, these locations. The other uh, objective we have is again, we still offer the uh, service to the plant developers. And we also teamed up with uh, Dr. Ryan Contreras at Oregon State, who was the environmental plant breeder there. Um, he's uh, one of the uh, co PIs, and we allow him to submit plants uh, for him to, to, for us to evaluate his plants that he wants to release under the tree. And we have, we, and he's released a couple from uh, from these, not from the full state, but from the California evaluations. He, he's released a couple under the tree. And of course, it's an extension project. We want to promote the use of our water plants. So here are some characteristics, some uh, comparisons about the different uh, locations. Uh, we can see you can see there's a, the difference in USDA zones. Um, you don't have sunset zones here, but yes. Southern Living, is that up here? No, we would just have a USDA zone. Yeah. So in Sunset, we have these different climate zones that uh, 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 also considers high, temp high temperatures in, in the regions. So USDA is mostly low temperatures, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, Any rainfall, water building, this is plant available water from, uh, from the soil web app and then the soil type. Um, because uh, you all know soils is really important to know uh, for managing irrigation. And so what the project objective are, objectives are. So we have a subset of plants that we try to select that we can test at all six sites. It's really difficult to find plants that will survive in six to 10. Um, and even from six to, to nine is hard, hard to find, but we do find some plants. Because this is a climate ready landscape plants. The, the, I guess the uh, overall thought was, if I have a plant that's doing well in Seattle, in 40 years, will that plant still be doing well? Uh, so we want to be able to answer those kinds of questions by testing that plant in Davis. If it does well in Davis, it will probably do well in Seattle in 40 years or more. So that's, that's, that's the, uh, the overall premise. Then we also have some regional testing of other plants. And for example, we'll have a subset of plants that we'll test at uh, Utah, Washington, and Oregon. And then we might have another subset of plants that we'll test in California and, and Arizona because those climate zones are, are, are more similar. We also might have some plants that we'll do at uh, Davis and Oregon and Washington, for example. So just some information about who's involved. Um, uh, myself and Carrie, of course, were the originators. Uh, Alessandro Solis, a new, new uh, professor in our department, who I hope is going to take over for me. Um, Jared Sedaris, who I pointed out earlier, he is, uh, um, he's the project manager. At South Coast, um, Darren Haver and Natalie uh, Levy are the PIs down there. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of these PIs, how the linkages are, how they became PIs. Dr. Tugum Kim at University of Washington. Uh, here's Carrie Reed. Um, here's Jared. Here's Sue Kim and three graduate students in, in Sue's lab. There's a lot of graduate student involvement in these projects at, uh, at the sites. Oregon State. Uh, this is actually at the North Willamette Research and Extension Center in Aurora, not in Corvallis. Uh, Aurora is just south of, of Portland. And Dr. Lloyd Ackley and uh, Ryan Contreras are the leads there. And again, here's Jared again. Jared's our Troy Kent 
a Roy camp, or, you know, said Lasso, right? Here, there, everywhere. Uh, Utah State, uh, Yuping Sun, and Chital, y'all. Uh, again, here's Chital with Jared looking at uh, this one. Rosa did really well up there. This is 20%. And in Ursula Shook at the University of Washington, and again, Jared. Um, so these PIs are all, it's, uh, they came out because they're all really good friends of mine. <laughs> I've known Ursula Shook since the 1980s. She was an extension. She actually had my job back in the 1980s. And I, when I was a grower, I knew her then. Sue Kim and I were in the same lab in, in Davis. Um, Lloyd Nackley at Oregon State was Sue Kim's first PhD student, my first postdoc. Um, uh, uh, Darren Haver was, I knew him since he was an undergraduate. He was Ursula Shook's first PhD student. And one of my best friends, uh, Darren, and uh, you think Sun um, was actually, I actually invited Larry Rupp at Ohio, uh, Utah State because he was a good friend of mine, but he retired and you Sun built his spot. So it's a bit all my friends. So. And that's why I want to stay involved in this project so I can go visit my friends on research. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the plants that we tested, all the locations, uh, a couple of uh, hibiscus syriacus, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, these two, this one and this one are. Uh, Ryan Contreras's developed uh, genotypes that he developed, and then a couple of uh, a rose and a vitex. Vitex is becoming a really interesting study for physiology. We found out. 2023, uh, Periopterus, Anthus, Salvia vitex, and uh, a rose. So, and for these plants, then we can do those cross comparisons across all the sites. And then again, there's also subsets of plants that we have within uh, smaller groups or locations. So other things that allows us to do this. Um, one of the things I like to say to all the PIs is we have this really cool infrastructure, it's really neat team. There's physiologists that are involved that much better physiologists than I, or I ever will be. Um, but how do we exploit this, this infrastructure and this team? And so uh, this allows us to look at um, the plasticity of water stress. So we would take a set of plants that we had at uh, all six sites. We try to look at a time when all treatments would be irrigated. So we would do some physiological studies just prior to irrigation so we get the highest water stress levels. And then 24 hours after irrigation, 24, 48, 72, and seven days after irrigation, see how they recover. And then we did that at all six locations, really neat. And then other aspects of uh, water stress, uh, oops, chlorophyll fluorescence model conducted. So uh, that, that new uh, LIPOR 600 um, allows us to conduct these, as was mentioned, it's really fast. It takes only like 15 seconds to do both those measurements. And then also Washington, they wanted to look at stomatal density to see if there was any plasticity associated with water stress with stomatal density and stomatal conductance. And then we um, we gave up on stem water potential. You know that just takes a lot of effort, a lot of time. It's really hard to court. Um, we didn't really see a lot of uh, information from, from that study as well. But we, we're continuing with, with these. Uh, Vitex, I wanted to make a note of Vitex. We found that with Vitex, it didn't matter what treatment they were on or what stage of the treatment they were on. The stomatal conductance was always really high. It didn't make any sense, and they were growing really well. Um, what we did notice also, what UW uh, folks noticed, is that when they're under really high water stress and the sunlight is really intense, they would flip their leaves because they have a lot of trichomes on the bottom side of the leaves that were lighter colored, so we make those higher reflectance. Um, but they still, uh, uh, the transpiration is still really high. Lauren, are, are the emitters like drippers or is there a ring? <clears throat> yeah, so there's, a, the there's a drip emitter with a ring that just distributes the water around the plant. Yeah. yeah. I've heard a new definition of an expert. An expert is someone who's made all the mistakes that could possibly be made. And having done this for 20 years, I can say that we're experts because we made all the mistakes you can make. Uh, and so additional projects, uh, we thought about trees. You know, trees are used to mitigate thermal walls of buildings. It took a long time to become established. 
become established to develop any effect. So we submitted a project to USDA again and got funded for uh, focusing on vines. Uh, they vines grow faster. There's a lot of studies on heat mitigation using vines, but none of them look at water use. And that's what we do is look at plant water use. So we put together these fields. You can see there's um, there's a, each one of these installations is this two T-bar posts with this uh, 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 cattle or livestock panel. Each location uh, has 240 of these installed. So we each of one of us pounded 480 of these posts, and we tried looking at the chemical stuff, but this way is the best way. Undergraduates. <laughs> uh, so we measure, we will measure light interception and growth rates and plant water use in this study. There's up to 10 taxa per site. Uh, there's one site that feels a little smaller, so they can only put in, I think, seven. Uh, at all sites, are, we have uh, uh, a set of plants, Vitus Water Shred, uh, Parthenosis Cornifolia. Uh, Begonia, Madame Galen, and Lunisura Goldland. So these four cultivars are at all 10 sites. And then we also have uh, uh, subsets at, at different sites. And we, we'll start collecting data in 2024. So 2023 is their establishment year. <clears throat> So UW has put together their website for the climate ready plants and that's the uh, uh, intent is for each institution to put together their own website because each institution has their responsibilities to their in-state clientele. So they need to put together, they will be putting together their own websites. Uh, UC Davis, we have a website that has the, uh, it's like the project uh, link site where uh, we have the description of the project, but we link to all the other uh, uh, websites at the other institutions. There's a lot of uh, extension to the suggested last couple of years. Uh, Pacific Horticulture is an online magazine. Um, uh, they released three videos on the project, specifically on our project and how we set it up, what our intentions are, what our outcomes are expected are. Uh, Utah, Utah put together a video and then there's a, a few more newsletter blogs and things like that. So this is just a really short list of what's come out. And then other impacts, um, there's this selection of uh, Lipia notiflora, uh, Paraphia. So it's a, 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 a turf alternative. Uh, it's a Western native plant, but the selection is out of Japan. And they, we've done testing uh, on, on this. Uh, I think they have like four cultivars of it now. But I wanted to, this is a, a, a shot, screenshot of their web, website, and I want to point out this, this text down here. And it says, crop is a highly versatile UC tested drop tolerant ground cover, et cetera. So you get recognition that it's tested at uh, UC Davis. We have data that shows that it's really a uh, good performer at low water use. We think it'll do well at 10%, because it just did super at 20 uh, Star Roses of Plants and their new rose catalog uh, just came out a couple of months ago. Uh, for This is for their rose double knockout. You can see the blue ribbon uh, logo there. It says, winner for outstanding low water performance in 2017 vocals trials, which they call our trials. They have a whole page that lists all of their roses, uh, drought tolerant roses. And I'll blow up this text up here. And it says, drought tolerant roses, University of California landscape plant irrigation trials. An important figures trial for trials for determining heat drought tolerance of plants. Varieties are grown and monitored following irrigation percentages in one of classifications of landscape species. Four, those that exhibit superior overall results on low water are awarded the blue ribbon performed at UC Davis. So we're seeing um, a really nice application or usefulness of this information. I actually, this last week, I got a call from May Ambrose's in France. Uh, they want to use the same kind of language in their, in their catalog. So this is just what we talked about real quickly. Um, background, the experiment, multi-state project, future work and impacts. And that's my talk. Question? Yeah. Uh, one of my brothers, uh, when I was growing up in Oregon, was really interested in large data science. Um, 
And one of the things to talk about was how, um, because of things are like a that environment, they don't require like a lot of like external water. Um, have you looked into like collecting data on that? On, on the it's funny you should mention data plants. So the question is about data plants, so about information on, on data plants. We just submitted a, or actually we are submitting, preparing a proposal for USDA focusing on native plants using our sites. And we want to test local native plants, regional versus, so we want to have a set of plants, local native, regional native, or cultivars of natives to see if they, how uh, plant performance compares and also pollinator support. So there's a big deal about pollinator support of a higher diversity of pollinators on local native plants, but there's not a lot of data on that. There's some data, but not, not a lot of data, and certainly not a lot of data across the Western US. So we're going to see that. The first thing that you look at, look at growth. But what about the impact on like flowering or yellowing leaves? Is that we still have some stress? It might still grow well, but maybe they. Yeah, so the question. Yeah, so the question is about flowering and foliage quality in response to the trees. And we do measure those. So, of those qualitative um, measures, foliage quality is one. Uh, and we look at um, uh, the aesthetic quality of the, of the foliage, of coloring, of uh, shaped leaves. In, also in there, we looked at disease resistance and pest resistance because that affects foliage. And the other thing we look at is, again, is flowering. Flowering is the one parameter that we look at twice a month because we don't want to miss a flowering season. We want to know if it affects flowering uh, appearance uh, um, uh, when the flowers first emerge or the flowering duration. We want to know that. So we do look at those things. So. Anything else? You might just say out loud, is there any question from Geneva? Is there any questions from Geneva? How do I find those? <laughs> well, there, there would be a voice coming from above. <laughs> okay, apparently not. Dude, that's God. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> All right, anything else? Yeah. Um, last year, it seemed like it was an unreasonably wet uh, um, winter in California. Yeah, well, um, is, yeah. is that going to mean that there is that going to like mess up this summer's trial? I guess. It did. Yeah. Yeah. So we thought that we would be killing plants because of over irrigation or lack of irrigation during our treatments. Last year, we had this record rainfall year in California. In let's see, it was in September twenty. Two, we had a project team meeting, meeting in Davis. Uh, the next day, we were going to have an open house field event, and our project team was going to be present at this open house field event. event. We were at dinner, and it just dumped rain. And it rained, I think it rained two inches that night. So Jeremy and I went out to the field after dinner, and it was a lake. So we canceled the event uh, that night. Went back out the next day and it was still a lake. Uh, this summer, when you're collecting data, we lost a lot of plants. And it was the one year where we were focusing on desert plants. Oh, no. <laughs> and so we lost complete cultivars. Uh, so out of the 10 species that we normally test, I think we had that on six. At any one time, how many uh, species or cultivars would you have in the trial? In Davis, we have, so because it takes two years, we have two fields, yeah. but we have alternating uh, uh, planting dates. And, uh, so we have that every year. So we have two two meter fields in the sun. We have two two meter fields in the shade. We have two three meter fields in the sun. Yeah. And we have, now we have one uh, vines field. So, so in your two by two, you might run 40 cultivars through each we year? Run, or we run 10, 10 per cycle 10, in okay. the sun. Okay. In the shade, it's uh, four per cycle. In the three meter field, it's five per cycle. And then all the planting, is that all with a shovel by hand? Yes. Or you, have, you, have, you haven't invented some nice little machine? Undergraduates. To... 
No, we do. We have we have access to labor crews, farm labor crews on campus, so we'll hire them to help us do the planting and cultivation. Stuff like that. But in the, you know, it's a it's a great opportunity for undergraduates to collect data and do plant care and stuff like that. And the nurseries must love this, right? I mean, they would be donating all the plants, I'm sure, and they they must be very excited by all of this. We get a lot of plant donations. Uh, in addition to the plant donations, we ask for that fee, $500. $500 is a lot of money. That's so some, money. some people it is, but it's for the big companies, it's not our career. Yeah. Um, we do have, when we get funding from agencies, we do set aside some money for plant, uh, uh, to uh, procure plants, because there are some plants that we want to test. Uh, there are some plants that Brian wants to test, but he's a researcher, so he has to be funded for those kind of plants. Anything else? Okay, so I'm going to Yeah, so the question is about photo documentation, and we do a lot of that until this year, <clears throat> because Carrie retired last year, she was the one doing that, and I took over, and I'm not very good at that. Um, she's a really good plant photographer, I'm not, um, but yeah, she, every month she would take a picture of plants, all the plants on each of the treatments, um, I think three times a year she would do that. And, and you know, that's a lot of pictures. That's a lot of times. A lot of times. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.